Good morning and welcome to the uh, American Security Project's uh, press conference on launching our report on climate change and the effectiveness of divestment. Uh, just a, a quick word about the American Security Project. We're a nonpartisan uh, education institute um, founded to examine the strategic challenges around our national security. And we firmly uh, understand and believe that climate change is real and it has a direct challenge to our national security. Human activity is responsible for nearly 20 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year. This is a number that has quadrupled since 1950. Scientists agree that humans are a cause of climate change. Climate change poses three distinct challenges to our national security. First, it creates global instability around the world, which the US will need to respond to. Second, extreme weather is affecting our homeland security. And third, it will have a cost implication to rebuild our military infrastructure. On global instability, we have seen areas in Africa, in uh, the Middle East that the US and its allies have had to respond to. Uh, in our homeland, we have had extreme weather such as Sandy, which we've had our military, um, airmen, Marines, soldiers, all having to respond to. And thirdly, in our military infrastructure, we will need our bases to be rebuilt. For example, Norfolk uh, Naval Base, which is the biggest naval base in the world, um, rising sea levels, will mean that we will almost have to rebuild the whole base, costing billions and billions of dollars. The report that we're launching today uh, is part of ASP's long work on climate change, and it focuses on how effective fossil fuel divestment campaign in the United States will be and is in combating these national security threats of climate change. And I'm going to hand it over to Andrew Holland, who's uh, the American Security Project's Senior Fellow for Energy and Climate, who will uh, run through the report. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for uh, the, uh, a quick summary of, uh, I guess, my three years w of work here at ASP. So uh, it, there's a, a lot of detail and a lot of stuff that we've done on uh, climate change and national security uh, here at ASP uh, over many years, uh, and uh, we think it's important enough and serious enough uh, that uh, we have to figure out uh, the most effective ways to, to deal with it uh, and to uh, address it. Uh, so uh, the object of today's report to, is to uh, look through uh, the divestment movement, uh, whether it's effective, how effective it is, and then to talk about where to go from here and, and uh, that sort of stuff. So what I'm going to do is first run through kind of a quick origin and objective of the divestment movement, then uh, talk about uh, effectiveness, uh, how we find uh, divestment fails to address climate change, and then finally we'll talk about some uh, possible alternative solutions. Uh, so, uh, to start, kind of the, the origins, objectives of the, the divestment movement uh, focused mostly at this point uh, within the United States on uh, universities, uh, but certainly also looking to, to pension funds, to uh, charitable foundations, uh, to uh, all the way up to, to large um, state pension funds and, and, and groups like that. Um, the uh, origin kind of comes from, uh, it's a tool used by activists uh, to fight apartheid in South Africa and to fight against large tobacco companies. Um, the goal here is threefold. Uh, stated tactics are threefold. So first, to send a message to fossil fuel companies uh, that, uh, that society is moving against fossil fuels. Two is to si stigmatize uh, these companies uh, so that uh, it's difficult for them uh, to uh, get the capital needed to, uh, for investments and mergers. And finally, um, to start to change public opinion uh, against uh, 
against fossil fuels and in favor of renewable energy sources. Um, these, uh, I should I should really say that these are are worthy goals. Um, you know, the idea is to decarbonize the economy. The idea, as as Paul stated, that the national security. Uh, uh, rationale for addressing climate change is clear and present. Uh, what we find is not that the objectives are wrong, but the tactics are um, uh, not effective. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first is the, the sheer size of the United States energy sector. Uh, this is not a uh, a battleship you could turn around very quickly. This is not something that's, uh, if you simply, in, in in some some sort of world, you were able to simply cut off the tap of all investment. Uh, the fact of the matter is, 80 percent of U.S. domestic energy, what we see, the the way we light our rooms, the way we drive our cars, the way we heat our homes, uh, is produ produced for, via the burning of fossil fuels. Now, what's interesting is that since I've started at ASP, that's gone from 83 percent to 80 percent. So things are changing, things are moving. That's only in four years. Uh, so there's a, a clearly a movement in this direction. Um, but that's because of markets, that's because of government policies, that's because of a, a, a wide range of other things. Uh, and you know, we would say that it's important to, to move that forward in that direction. Uh, the other thing is that the, you know, crude oil, natural gas, uh, other fossil fuel production is a big part of the, uh, the economy, uh, represents about 8 percent of the U.S. economy, provides more than 9.8 million jobs. 8 percent of the U.S. economy, by the way, is they, it, it almost, oh, single digits, that sounds small. That's a trillion dollars. Uh, in in U.S. Uh, GDP, that's a significant uh, amount. Um, tax revenue, eighty-five million dollars a day uh, in tax revenue. Uh, energy sector has over two trillion dollars currently invested in capital projects. Uh, so these are are, are big numbers, uh, and uh, we find that simply pulling out from that is uh, is not going to be enough to, uh, to move on. Uh, so to look at effectiveness, uh, the, f the first thing we'll say uh, about effectiveness is it, it will focus on, on university uh, funds, university uh, endowments. Uh, only 5 percent of uni university funds uh, are invested in fossil fuel companies, so roughly $22 billion. The returns from a, an endowment we know are invested towards scholarships, research funding, campus infrastructure, and other university programs. Uh, and uh, the fact is, is that uh, if they divest that that five percent, uh, we've seen uh, good economic reports uh, that show that that will actually reduce the uh, uh, the return on investment for the the funds. Um, Another thing about the uh, effectiveness of this is that you can divest, for, if you divest from private uh, publicly traded firms, private sector publicly traded firms, you're missing the vast majority of, of reserves. Uh, Seventy-five percent of all crude oil production in the world comes from state-owned owned companies. Even An even greater portion of uh, proven reserves is in state-owned oil companies. You can't divest from Saudi Aramco. You can't divest from uh, the, the largest, you can't, from uh, Venezuelan state-owned companies. You can't divest from these, these firms. So uh, you're choosing targets that are uh, closer to home uh, and targets that are, frankly, owned by uh, uh, by American uh, companies as opposed to uh, targets that are owned by, uh, by people uh, abroad. Um, and, and so we, we've looked in our report 
uh, about the effectiveness, and we found that um, the effectiveness of the divestment campaign um, it, it does not work to tackle uh, our national security threats of climate change. So we uh, finally looked at some key points that actually could work. Right, right. So, uh, so if we if we say it's it, it's ineffective. Uh, it, you know, it, it's been ineffective in the past, will be ineffective uh, in the future. Uh, it, it's ineffective for, for a whole number of reasons. Oil and gas companies are resilient to stigma. You know, they say, oh, we want to stigmatize these companies. Well, going back to Standard Oil and John D. Rockefeller, oil companies have, have been stigmatized in the United States. Uh, and people still have continued to buy their products at ever-increasing demands. Um, what we need to do, as Paul said, is to move into a more effective uh, way to do this. Uh, so there's uh, a couple of solutions here. Uh, first is don't divest, invest. Um, divestment from oil and gas companies we know has negligible impact. Um, but what we'd say is that, you know, we're not against using an endowment for uh, future investment. So let's let's invest in in renewable energies, in non-carbon energies. Let's invest in uh, also in in existing fossil fuel companies. And I'd say, you know, over the next thirty years, we're going to have the energy sector in the world is going to have to invest about seventy trillion dollars. That's with with a T. Seventy trillion dollars over the next thirty years or so. Uh, and uh, there's a real choice about how that investment's going to be made. If you believe those investments should be made in a lower carbon, zero carbon way, your voice has to be heard. And one of the best ways for your voice to be heard is to be an investor, to be, uh, you know, to be raising your voice within the company, to be a, a, an owner, a shareholder within the company. If you don't own stock in the company, you don't get a voice in where those investments are going to be made. So, uh, you know, we think that the, the, one of the real solutions here is, is to invest as opposed to divesting. And then secondly, the, so, so that's, that's a solution for the, the uh, endowments to be working for. Secondly, the, the, the solution for the campaigners uh, is to look to Washington here. Look, come, come you know, Act, get active in Washington, campaign in Washington, campaign in your local state governments, campaign in your uh, national governments, campaign uh, for all this and, and change the way Washington works, change the way uh, we all work. So um, I know I've been out there uh, all around the country talking about this issue. Uh, and I think that's what, that's what we're working on and that's what we're working towards. Uh, and then finally, uh, it, it's a working towards, you know, more effective tools like carbon pricing, uh, more effective tools like government investment in next generation energies, uh, uh, really figuring out what the, the way forward is. Uh, so ultimately, we find that divestment in oil co companies cannot uh, provide a, a solution uh, for climate change and, and that we uh, should instead uh, move towards a, uh, a more effective way forward. So thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, turn it back to yes. Paul. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, the threats of climate change are serious and imminent. Responding to these requires seriousness and dedication. And that's what we found in our report. There is far much more detail in the report than we can give here. Uh, but if you've got any questions, we're, we're able to answer them. Uh, otherwise, all our material is on our website uh, with all our work over the last few years on climate change and its uh, seriousness and its threat to our national security. So if there's any questions, we'll take them. Question. I just want to make sure I have everybody's name yeah. spelling right. Yeah, my name is uh, Paul Hamill, which is uh, P-A-U-L, and then it's H-A-M-I-L-L. -L. And Andrew Holland, A-N-D-R-E-W, Holland, H-O-L-L-A-N-D, like the country. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, just a broad question um, on divestment. Um, you seem to be saying it's an ineffective tool. 
I, I want to frame it a little bit differently. What's the harm I, in I divestment? Mean, I, 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 there are, there's the harm in um, to the financial institutions for the universities that, uh, first of all, do not get the return on investment that they need and so affects uh, their endowment and, and their way of providing benefit for the students and for the universities. There is also uh, the, the problem of um, what I call the opportunity cost. In, in s it, it is great to see many young people invested and concerned about climate change and what we need to do to, uh, to tackle climate change. But because this is ineffective, what we really should be doing is looking at uh, how do we engage with government uh, to increase investment in next generation technologies? How do we engage with government to set a price on carbon? That, and using the market mechanisms uh, to do that. There's more in the report. Yeah. Um, so I'm Eugene from Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thanks. Wondering, uh, hi Andrew, hi, hi. Paul. Um, <laughs> so I feel like part of the story is missed out in terms of how divestment creates a social movement. Social movements are normally started in universities like the divestment movement has and eventually morph into something more, even if it's un ineffective in tackling the oil and gas sector right now and divesting from it and reducing climate change that way, eventually you could foresee the divestment movement turning to something, a campaign for carbon pricing across the United States. And if you have this, um, well, if you have the beginnings of a social movement in divestment, well, do you think that's a good beginning in the uh, social movement? and? Is that important? I, I mean, I think it's, I think, you know, like I was saying, I think it's wonderful that, that young people especially are, are involved in this issue. Uh, that is a good thing. The problem with it is, again, this opportunity cost of, of we're running out of time and we need to t tackle climate change seriously uh, and that's effectively. And then also match with that is the fact that they're actually harming the universities and, and the financial uh, uh, services um, right now. And, and frankly, harming their own leverage. Yeah. Uh, I think that they, the, there's a clear case that they would be more effective as, uh, as owners uh, with a, you know, to uh, be kind of an activist investor role. To, to raise their their voice within uh, within the systems and, and and you know tell you know their their owners to uh, tell their their companies uh, to uh, change their policies and move in a different direction I agree you know I, I think uh, it's great for there to be a, uh, a kind of a growing movement now I was uh, I was in New York during the uh, uh, the big climate march in in the fall, and it was uh, unbelievable how many people, young people, old people, um, rich people, poor people, uh, political leaders, and uh, kind of the the unheard uh, three to four hundred thousand people walking in the streets. There is a movement here. Uh, that movement wasn't around divestment; it was around climate change and its concern about climate change. And I think. You know, we need to ensure that that focus doesn't get pulled from uh, the, the, the movement towards uh, getting a real uh, climate agreement uh, at the UN and working at the national level to get effective policies on climate change. So, you know, we think that it's, uh, it's important to um, yes, of course, have have social movements, but let's let's get the social movements uh, pushed in the right direction. Hi, thanks, Zach Coleman with the Washington Examiner. I came late, so I'm back here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there there. What do you take of some of these industry-backed studies that have come out? Uh, there was one that came out on Tuesday that was backed by the Independent Petroleum Association of America. I mean, usually when you're spending money on stuff like that, it, it hints at there is some effect of this movement. Um, 
so you know you're you're sitting here and saying that there hasn't it hasn't been effective, but they're they're spending money on it. Exxon Mobil has done blog posts on it. Uh, you know, so uh, could you comment on what you're seeing out of industry on I, this? I would say it, it, it's not that it hasn't been effective in uh, getting a response from the fossil fuel companies. Uh, it, it clearly has, and and uh, and I wonder uh, if it's got them spooked or what. I don't know. Um, uh, we're saying that it's, it hasn't been effective in pulling any single molecule of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere or reducing the amount that that's pulled out. Uh, that's unfortunately the only measure of effectiveness we can we can look at for for climate change. So um, the the way forward has to be figuring out a way to actually reduce emissions, uh, not a way to uh, make ourselves feel good because we're not uh, a part of it. Hi there. Um, can't see. Uh, so I think um, I'm going to say that I, I agree with the gentleman up front that y'all have taken an altogether uh, too narrow view here and fundamentally, fundamentally misunderstand the substrate where divestment takes place. You're, like you said, looking at, um, you know, has this taken an ounce of carbon out of the air yet? Uh, this is not a zero sum thing. These people are all working across all different things uh, working on climate change. The, um, the thing here is that, like the Keystone Movement, um, divestment draws a line in the sand, psychologically. And I think that you have failed to see the virtue of a vanguard. Um, if these people are asking for the most extreme thing, which is to end the fossil fuel economy immediately, then the next most extreme thing becomes much more palatable to the populace at large. Um, finally, uh, two quick notes. Um, one, you mentioned that action on climate has to be serious, immediate, and dedicated. Uh, shareholder activism is none of those. Um, finally, uh, if there are any real journalists here, please come out to Global Divestment Day uh, Friday. DuPont Circle, 5.30 p.m. You'll learn a lot more than you have here. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your advertising. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we disagree. Um, we, we believe that um, uh, the issue is tackling global climate change by reducing CO2 emissions. Uh, the divestment campaign does not do that. Well, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to uh, fight you on it because I, I do... Uh, I do agree that uh, people feel like they, they need to be doing something and should be doing something. Uh, and, and I applaud that. Uh, and, uh, and I'll be walking around to DuPont uh, tomorrow. Uh, I want to see what you guys are working on and what you're talking about. Uh, so uh, I think that's, that's an important, uh, you know, it's a, it is an important uh, conversation to be had, but uh, I do... Uh, in the end, I think we have to have to figure out a way to uh, to get serious about this and and uh, and get to work. Any other questions? Sure, you do. Um, so, in response to my question, you said that students should be investing their money where. <laughs> in our companies? No, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, the university the, endowments. The university. So they, they should be advocating through their university endowments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> students. students don't have too much money. <laughs> but they, they could advocate, for instance, through the endowment for then the endowment to change their position within. You're right, of course. It's not, it's not quick and it's not fast. Uh, neither is divestment quick or fast. Um, uh, I, I do find that quick and fast methods are changing government policies uh, and changing the market incentives. So, uh, oh, oh, thank you very much uh, for turning up. You will find lots more on our website, especially all the uh, the issues of uh, why climate change is a national security threat. Yeah, feel free to uh, to engage with us through our yeah. website, through our Twitter, through our blog, through our however else we, we can get out there. So thank you all and thanks for coming and thanks for the questions. Thanks.